This is a great transition point into cryptocurrencies. The way I understand Bitcoin versus Ethereum, which Ether is a cryptocurrency within Ethereum, is Bitcoin is a hedge against inflation and Ethereum is a, a bet on blockchain technology because you can build smart contracts on top of uh, Ethereum, which you cannot do with Bitcoin. Um, do you think Bitcoin is a hedge against inflation? And that's um, partially why people are buying in. Uh, I know there's many factors and we can get into that of why people are buying into Bitcoin. And, you know, 20, I guess the end of 2020 into the beginning of 2021, you've seen this huge momentum in Bitcoin. Um, I think there was momentum in 2017, if I remember that number correctly, but then it died down. Um, what are your, your opinions on Bitcoin? The, uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked. I am a bit skeptic about Bitcoin. Uh, yes, the uh, store of value slash inflation hedge you know, is one of the value propositions put out by the proponents. Um, I don't think it's a very good hedge. And as I just said, you know, if you're buying insurance, you expect to pay for that. You, know, you don't really expect to make money off the insurance policy. That, uh, now, where I'm you know, you know, kind of slow on the uptake is to try to figure out what people are really going to use Bitcoin for. You know, so when I put my fundamental investor hat on, what is the use case? You know, so, you know, again, if you think about the Warren Buffett proposition of, you know, don't buy anything for five minutes that you wouldn't hold for five or 10 years. So if I look forward and say 10 years from now, what will people be using Bitcoin for? And when I look at all of the things that people have been saying people are going to do with Bitcoin, I'm thinking uh, there are a lot of better opportunities. There are other solutions that provide better solutions. And the, uh, you know, so if somebody finds one, I wish they'd really let me know. So but indeed. Can I ask you a ahead. question for, in terms of my perspective, because yeah. I am pro cryptocurrencies and that may be a, a generational thing. Um, you know, I'm no expert in the technology of it. I think the technology is fascinating, but I just want you to pick holes in my perspective of it. And, you know, I'm, no expert on anything and nor do I think I, I am, nor do I want to be an expert on anything. I always want people to pick holes so I can improve from that. So oh, I, I, I'm the same way. So I want you to pick holes in my arguments too. Okay, okay. cool. You know? Yeah, of course. Let's, we'll okay. Do that. okay. So, but I am also a fan of crypto technology. You know, okay. I started out as an electrical engineer. I uh, got my uh, engineering degree at Caltech where I overlapped with Hal Finney, one of the early Bitcoin people. Uh, I did not know how well, but uh, I hung out basically with you know the same kind of uh, techie nerd crowd. <laughs> okay. the, uh, so, anyways, I think blockchain technology is really incredibly useful, and we're seeing it being rolled out in a number of real-world applications. Now, as far as Bitcoin goes. Unfortunately, you know, after doing engineering, I switched to economics and finance. And so, you know, I, I knew a little bit too much economic history. And I realized that, hmm, governments have this nasty habit of pushing aside private monies. Because mainly because governments love to have a uh, monopoly on money for a number of reasons, uh, control over the people, and it's quite profitable. Now, of course, you know, one of the reasons why a lot of people love cryptos is the, oh, it's not you know, controlled by a government. That has pluses and minuses. And we could probably talk for hours on that one. And I suspect we will. <laughs> the, uh, so people, uh, you, know, you know, so the early folks in the Bitcoin community were basically computer science types who you know, didn't know how hard it was to start a new currency. And they start going, wow. We can make this, we can print money with our computers. Wow, way cool. But then they had a problem. They didn't have anything to spend it on. And all the Bitcoins they'd mined were gonna to be totally useless unless they convinced other people to do something with them. Mm -hmm. So they have this strong economic incentive to proselytize to the world why these cryptos are the greatest thing 
ever created. Indeed, if there were a Nobel Prize for marketing, it should go to Satoshi Nakamoto because he created the most viral marketing scheme ever. Because once somebody drinks the Bitcoin Kool-Aid, one of two things is going to happen. Either Bitcoin fades away, in which case they feel like an idiot, or it takes off. Well, so now you have the strong incentive to go around and tell everybody that this is the best thing on the planet. And so, and what we've seen is this sort of epidemiological infection go out. You know, it starts off in, you know, the computer community and then you have various groups kind of find out about it. And, you know, so you see this, uh, you know, almost like with computer games, the cycle of adoption where, you know, people get really into it. You know, the price spikes up and then it kind of fades away. And, but then another group gets into it and get excited about it and the price goes up. And, you know, recently, you know, what we've seen is, you know, we've seen some, you know, enthusiasm over the happening. And we've also seen a couple of uh, people with deep pockets drink the Kool-Aid. And now they've become big evangelists for it. And you know, now at some point, you're going to run out of new populations to infect. You know, so at some point, there will no longer be you know, somebody else to buy in. And at that point, and I have no idea where Bitcoin will be at that point. Okay? The, um, I'm not really good at short-term speculation. You know, at that point, in the final analysis, the value of Bitcoin will be a function of its utility. Now, for many of the applications for Bitcoin and other cryptos, utility needs to have a very stable value or else it's not going to be useful. Okay, so people talk about, oh, it's a store of value. Well, is it really a store of value if it goes up or down 5 or 10% in a day? Hmm. The uh, not not a very useful one at that. You know, so it clearly flunks the short term store of value test. Now, the true believers basically go, oh, oh, well, but long term it will stabilize. Why? I, I don't see why. But anyways, the uh, it was originally designed as a payment system, but the cost of processing a single Bitcoin trade is way too high. Now, in the early days, you know, the early crypto believers basically looked at Bitcoin as a payment system and you know, thought that uh, we would all go to McDonald's and just sort of you know, pay out of our wallet for a cup of coffee. But guess what? The transaction fees now are a whole lot more than a cup of coffee. Now, you know, the true believers have you know, since switched and said, oh, oh, but we'll put in a second level you know, like the Lightning Network and that'll make it work. Well. Maybe, but we have plenty of other payment systems out there that, uh, you know, uh, cross-border payments, they're a mess. Yes, cross-border cross payments are a mess. And uh, the, uh, there are dozens of fintechs out there that are working on better cross-border payment systems. And the, uh, you know, so is Bitcoin the only way to, to smooth cross-border payments? No. Uh, and, you know, see the problem with cross-border payments is it's not the cost of shipping the electrons over the ocean. It's the cost of getting the money into electronic form on one side and getting it out on the other. So until you get a native economy that runs on Bitcoin, it's not really going to be a viable currency. Um, if you think about what is money, um, I love the uh, Deutsche, Bunde Bank, Deutsche Bundesbank's <clears throat> definition in their money museum. Money is what counts. The fundamental use of money is as a unit of account. And you know, even in civilizations that basically didn't have precious metals or other things, people would keep track of who owed what to whom. And that's, you know, that's what we do with money. And that's where distributed ledger comes in. That's why I think blockchain technology, really cool. That um, the, um, so I find the store of value use case you know, 
unappealing. The cross-border currency one is one that I think is quickly fading away. That you know, other technology is bringing down the cost of cross-border payments. I do know some people who move money across borders between the U.S. and Mexico, um, you know, because Bitcoin is sort of a way to do that. But again, when you've got your spending power in pesos or dollars, and that's you know fairly stable from day to day. Yes, you know, prices do change. But with Bitcoin going up or down 5% in a day, whoa, um, tends to get real expensive on the, the transaction front. What are, what, are, what are some of the holes in what I've said so far? You know, there's no one particular hole that I could, you know, try to explore. But there are um, things that I want to talk about in terms of... I think one way to look at it is if the US dollar does fail and other currencies do fail, you have this mediums of exchange that can be used within a community that you can take offline uh, that isn't stored. Like my money is, I don't own cash. I don't have money under my mattress. Sorry, all the thieves that are trying to come and get that money from the mattress. I don't do that anymore. It's all in a bank. It's digital money, but I don't own that money. The bank owns that money. You know, it's my money. If I want to go get that money, hopefully they have that money. Hopefully not everyone's running to the bank at the same time and I can get my money out. But with Bitcoin, it's this very interesting cryptocurrency where I could, you know, store that on my own USB and have that. And then shit hits the fan. And then all of a sudden I can use this as a mediums of exchange um, instead of having to trade one cow for one chicken. So there's that interesting um, ecosystem that can evolve. I think uh, if, I, if I remember what you said, there's less pools to infect because so many people have adopted it. I think there's still so many people that don't have access to Bitcoin or don't know how to properly get Bitcoin. You can get it from like Coinbase and you can actually have the coins and take it offline. If you get it through Robinhood, you can't actually take the cryptocurrency off. Robinhood owns that. So that's already kind of defeating what Satoshi Nokomoto, I hope I'm saying his name right, uh, what his uh, original purpose with the white paper of Bitcoin is. Um, I think it's interesting to see PayPal, Square, MasterCard now using it as mediums of exchange. Uh, I think there's so much power and momentum. And, you know, it might have been a great marketing idea and it might go down as one of the best marketing ideas but now that it has adoption and more and more people can get access to that and now use that to buy a cup of coffee i think it is an interesting asset class to explore um, another way to diversify your portfolio is a is a great way to look at it and there's a way i think about it uh now do you want all your assets in bitcoin no um but is it an interesting one to explore? Because is are we printing a lot of U.S. dollars? Yes. Are we circulating a lot of U.S. dollars? Yes. Is the inflation on the U.S. dollar going up? I believe so. Yes. Uh, I, I, that's just decreasing the value of every dollar I make because there's more circulating. Whereas uh, Bitcoin is an interesting asset class that I think can still quote unquote, if infect people that haven't been able to access it in a safe, comfortable way. Um, I think as you have more exchange like Coinbase that gain notoriety, have an IPO, people talk about it and they're like, oh, this is a safe way to get this cryptocurrency. I understand how to store it. There's still room for growth and adoption domestically and internationally. I think it was banned in India though, which is a huge market. Um, I'm not really sure about China, but uh, you know, those Asian countries, if you are able to get it, um, and I think what half of a billion people in India still don't have access to the internet, that's still a huge market share if it is able to uh, not be banned in India, if I remember that correctly. It's a huge market share to be captured from people that are willing to adopt it as a mediums of exchange. Um, so I do love blockchain technology, though. 
I think Bitcoin, I don't think that, like Dogecoin is going to ever compete with Bitcoin. I think there's only going to be one cryptocurrency that is going to do mass adoption. And that's the first one, the proof of concept, the one that has a marketing behind that. As much as I love Ethereum, I don't think Ether is ever going to be a big cryptocurrency as Bitcoin is. I don't think there's going to be, I don't know, there's so many cryptocurrencies now. I don't think there's ever going to be the, a Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin is the cryptocurrency that can be looked at as a diver diversification asset. Um, that's my whole perspective on Bitcoin. Now, when I shift to Ethereum, that's kind of a bet on blockchain technology and building upon that. And I don't know if you know about NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Um, it's basically, um, and I, I've been learning about this this past week, so I'm no... Uh, expert on it, but it's a way to buy, I guess you could think of it, digital art uh, at a very high level. Uh, you know, the, it's an interesting market. You know, trading cards used to be, I guess, for nerds 10, 20 years ago. And um, now it's really popular and cool. And now you can buy non-fungible tokens online, but you can only buy them using Ethereum. So I'm like, and maybe I'm not at the right like marketplaces to buy them with cash, but you have to buy them with Ethereum. And like, if I wanted to buy an art piece, a digital art piece, I would need Ethereum. So there's a use case right there to buy, uh, to use a cryptocurrency um, to buy an asset class. You know, art has always been a way of storing money in value. If there's a marketplace for that art, I think NFTs are an interesting way of doing that. The NBA has Topshop where you can buy now, instead of buying a trading card of LeBron James, you can buy a dunk of LeBron James in game six. And you can buy like a 30 or I don't know how long is a 10 second clip. And that's now your, your asset that you can have and you can buy it low and sell it high if people want to buy. I think it's very interesting as, as the younger generation grows up on technology and you know they grew up with an iPod, an, iP an iPhone or an iPad in their hands. Why would they want to have a physical thing? I think people are just going to be like, oh, I can just easily share this 10 second clip. Oh, you want to buy it for me for this much Ethereum? Uh, I think NFTs are an interesting uh, outcome of, I don't know if cryptocurrency is the right way to say it. Maybe, I, don't get me, don't quote me on the words, but, or hold me to the words, but it's an interesting way of using uh, blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. So, Oh, I am a huge fan of smart contracts, you know, and I, I love Ethereum, but the key thing to remember is you can have a smart contract on a variety of different platforms. And for any platform to succeed, the price of the gas has to be stable and predictable. So not every smart contract in the future is going to be on Ethereum. The, um, you know, there are plenty of other, uh, you know, attempts to make, you know, basically better Ethereums out there. And besides, if you're going to put a major application onto something, it's got to be something where the gas is affordable and predictable. So for those kind of utility tokens like Ethereum, um, in order for it to be successful, it's got to be stable and predictable and not a, a speculative toy. So that's... Uh, why I don't think the price of Ethereum is going to go to infinity. Yeah, because if it does, everybody will move their smart contracts onto another platform. Now, you also mentioned uh, you know, the diversification approach. Okay, and so, oh yeah, inflation, uh, therefore Bitcoin. Well, if inflation kicks up, you know, whoa, if it, what if it goes to 4% instead of 2%? How are you protecting yourself with something that goes up or down five or ten percent in a day? Hmm. There's very little short-term protection from something as volatile as cryptos. Now, and again, when you want insurance, you pay for it. So it's one thing to own some Bitcoin and put it right next to you know your gold coins, you know, in your bomb shelter, you know, with your year supply of food and your nitrogen-packed bullets. And you know all the other things that you have to prep against Armageddon, um, but you don't really expect to make money off that supply of food that you are uh, you know storing in your basement against Armageddon. 
that's the, uh, you know, so the, you know, the prepping argument, you know, <clears throat> you know, I'm not expecting Armageddon. So, you know, I, and if civilization does collapse, will there be an internet and electricity to actually transfer uh, <laughs> Bitcoin? Don't know. That, uh, so, and then you mentioned the diversification argument in a portfolio as an asset class. All right, so in my day job, I teach investments at Georgetown and you know, have the students actually do the math as to how do you optimize an investment portfolio? Well, uh, when you throw cryptos into it, people say, oh, it's a diversifier. Look at, look at how uncorrelated it is with the S&P 500. Well, during some periods it's uncorrelated, but you know, the volatility is so high that you really have to have a high expected rate of return in order to get any kind of a positive holding in a portfolio. So it's really how much in your portfolio is really a question of what you think the expected return is. Just putting pure noise into a portfolio as a diversifier lowers your investment utility. I mean, you don't want pure noise in a portfolio. So just the fact that it diversifies doesn't really get you anywhere you have to drink enough Kool-Aid to believe that it's got a really high positive rate of return. Now, speaking of inflation hedges, again, if you want insurance, you pay for it. So you know, there's a big debate as to whether commodities really are an asset class because the rate of return on any commodity is strictly a function of what time period you look at. You, know, you look at oil in the early zeros of this century, Wow, great return. Look at oil over the last decade, pretty lousy return. That, uh, and again, you, know, you look at gold. You can you know, you know, find periods where it's given you a great return, other periods where it's given you a really lousy return. And the problem with commodities, whether it's gold or oil or soybeans, they don't produce income. And you know, the... Um, you know, so do they really belong in an investment portfolio is a matter of debate. 